malware terms are always very squishy. What's a virus? What's a trojan? What's a you know, rootkit? But uh, for my purpose, a virus is a malware which self-replicates and based on some taxonomy I read long ago, I make the difference between worm and virus in that a virus requires some human help to continue propagation, whereas a, a propagation between systems at least, whereas a worm can like just automatically keep running around. So like a worm would be using an exploit to automatically hop between systems and so forth. Whereas a virus, if you think boot sector viruses back in the floppy disk days, you've got a human walking around with a disk plugging it into different machines and that's how it's spreading behind the scene. Yes, it can automatically copy itself to files, but in order to, you know, jump between machines, it's got some human either, you know, clicking on some social engineering email, moving around some file on a, um, on a floppy disk, etc. So it's, it's an academic point, but I consider a virus something that self-replicates but still needs humans to, uh, to, to move between systems. All right, so we're going to show the virus for PE files and the exact same thing that I'm going to show here would work on the ELF files. And, you know, you can go look at tutorials on virus writing and you'll see the exact same thing. You could probably write the basic one yourself if you really, you know, spent a week at it or so. All right, so conceptually, how a virus is doing this self-propagation is the viral code understands the file format that it wants to infect, whether it's executable, whether it's PDF or anything else. We're going to talk executables. And so what happens is there's some executable sitting around here and somewhere else there's a virus running. It sees the executable and it tacks the virus onto the file. It can tack it onto the end. It can uh, tack it somewhere in the middle and so forth. It doesn't really matter where it goes, but somehow the virus is attached to the file. And then there's different ways that the virus will subsequently get invocation. The simplest way is when it tacks itself to the end of the file, it changes the address of entry point field in the optional header in the PE context to just point down at its code down there towards the bottom of the thing. So that should, you know, that kind of looks pretty suspicious, right? You've got a address of entry point which doesn't just point at the normal .text section. It points at, you know, maybe there's no section defined down for that location. Maybe it's the resources section as you'll see with the virus today. The virus today, it's just going to take whatever the last section is expand the size in the section header and then, you know, tack itself down there at the bottom. And so when I see a, you know, address of entry point that points into the dot reloc section or the dot resource section, that's not right. It should point into the dot text section, right? And so they know that and they can potentially get around that. You know, certainly some of the early AV heuristics were just, if you've got an address of entry point that doesn't point in the dot text section, this is a malware file, right? And so, uh, to get around that sort of heuristic, what they would do is they would leave the header still pointing into the dot text section as normal, but then they just put a jump instruction as the first thing right at that address. So you point at the address of entry point, and then right the first instruction at address of entry point is jump to virus code, right? So then the next heuristic that the AV vendors used is they said, if I see address of entry point points directly to a jump, that's probably a virus code, right? And so you can keep playing these games forever. Right. Another way that you could potentially invoke a virus, right, is you could leave the headers pointing at the .txt section and you could add a TLS callback. And then the TLS callback will invite, invoke the virus code before, you know, the, the, op, the original entry point ever gets called. And like I said before, you could have it be in the text section. If there happens to be a little slack space at the end of the text section, you know, there's maybe some, some uh, padding in the file itself then you could have it be within the text section in that padding location. This is more common on the ELF viruses, but, uh, but you could have, because they add it as padding essentially, but in the context of PE, you could imagine that you've got that hex 200 bytes worth of space that will potentially be slack space on the end of your .text section. And so you could put yourself there and then you would still, uh, you know, ostensibly be within the .text section. And again, you can play the same game, like do virus code, inline hooks, and so forth. All right, and so the important thing is that I told you there's this technique that's applicable to viruses and exploits and rootkits used for the import address table hooking and stuff like that. So you should probably go check out this um, Win32 shellcode paper. It talks about this technique in the context of 
shell code specifically. But um, basically what it is, is it's a small snippet of assembly code which knows, first it knows how to get to kernel 32. That's the key thing. That's the thing which is why this is currently broken for Windows 7 and I haven't updated it. There's some extra Windows information that Windows keeps about what DLLs are loaded in memory and where. And so this is linked off of a data structure called the TEB thread environment uh, block. And so this TEB thread environment block points at the PEB, which is the process environment block, points at a linked list that says the stuff currently in my process space is, you know, notepad.exe and then ntdll and then kernel 32. Actually, I think it's ntdll. Yeah, that's notepad, ntdll, kernel 32, stuff like that. And so basically, once you know just this little bit of extra metadata about how Windows arranges this list, you can always find this thread environment block because it's, it's linked off of a segment register. It's just a convention on Windows that if you ever see, if you're ever reverse engineering stuff and you see something getting some offset from the FS register, so you see FS colon square bracket zero, it's accessing the first field of the TEB thread environment block. So it's very common for attackers to start at the TEB walk their way through a bunch of data structures, get to the kernel32.dll, and once you're at kernel32's base, then you start walking your way through the data structures according to the PE headers, right? You got kernel32's base, treat it like a DOS header, and then use that DOS header to find the NT header, and then use the NT header to find the optional header, use the optional header to find the export address table, use the export address table to find the export names table, use the export names table to find get proc address or create file or write file or load library, whatever thing you want. A lot of the functions that you really care about are in kernel 32. So once you can wind your way down to the export address table information for kernel 32, you can find a lot of functions that give you the functionality you need with ever, without ever having to have the operating system give them to you in the import address table. So um, Corey reminded me of this. It's a good paper by Scape that um, just talks about this shell code and gives you the context about this starting point for the thread environment block. But we're going to use this in the virus, and I'll point it out when we get to it, but Cora uses it in the exploits class. In the reverse engineering class, uh, they show you some malware that's using it to do, uh, to do runtime importing, like so without to find load library and get the proc address. 